it's Dr. Kenny to you again. This is Electromagnetism Lesson Number Two, our exercise tutorials. So how this video works is step one. The exercise question is posed, so I'll ask you the question and show it to you on screen. You pause and have a go at the question. Then step two, you continue to play the video. If you haven't quite grasped what's going on, I provide a small hint or a little bit of assistance. Again, you pause the video and complete the exercise. Third step, continue to play the video. I'll answer the question, but I'll also provide a worked explanation. It'll give you an understanding of why that was the answer. And then step four, continue to play the video onto the next question and repeat the process. So here's our first question. I'll just get my pointer turned on, ready to answer any questions that might pop up along the way. So question one, the strength of a magnetic field is determined by the core of the material and what's the other thing that determines the strength of a magnetic field? The cross-sectional area of the wire, B, the type of wire used, C, the number of turns used, or D, the length of the wire used. So pause here. Here's your hint. What will multiply up the magnetic field the most with those options? What would multiply up the magnetic field? It's about combining magnetic fields together to make a stronger magnetic field. So how do you think we could do that? Pause here. And here's the answer, the number of turns. If you remember, let's turn my pen on, the more turns that we add together, effectively it means we're putting more and more conductors side by side with all the current going in the same direction. Therefore, we end up with a much, much stronger magnetic field. So. All we're doing is putting lots and lots of little magnetic fields beside each other, creating one big solid magnetic field. So it's the number of turns. When current flows in the same direction in parallel conductors, where is it and what kind of force is between them? So there's a kind of force between them. When they're in parallel, what kind of force are we going to get between them? So the answer is A, we're going to get an attraction force. B, are we going to get a clockwise force in rotation to the current, in relation to the current, I should say. Or C, are we going to get uh, flux? Or are we going to get a repulsion force? So there are your four possibilities. Pause here. So here's your hint. So think about the direction of the magnetic fields. So what's going to happen? So the answer is attraction because they're all going in the same direction. We're going to get the fields are going to want to interlock, interlace with each other. So they're going to be attracted to each other. So if we've got parallel forces, in parallel conductors, currents flowing in the same direction, we're going to create magnetic fields that want to combine, therefore attraction. Question three, what determines the direction of a magnetic field around a conductor? So a thing called Fleming's law, direction of the current flow is B, C, the amount of current flowing, and D, the material type used for the conductor. So pause here. Here's your hint. What is the right hand rule all about? Do you remember the right hand rule? What's that all about? So here's the answer. It's the direction of the current flow. So what determines the direction of a magnetic field? It's directly related to the direction of the current. Moving on now to question 
Therefore, the magnetism that remains in a piece of steel after the magnetizing force is removed is termed what? So the question is, the magnetism remaining in a piece of steel after the magnetizing force has been removed, what's it termed? A. Temporary. B. Residual. C. Low. D. Permeability. So pause here. Here's your hint. List the different magnetic effects. List all the different kinds of magnetic effects you can get in a magnetic material. And here's the answer. It's called temporary. So particularly um, like a piece of steel, it'll pass a magnetic field, but once the magnetizing force has been removed, the magnetic field disappears altogether, the piece of steel returns to normal. So that's called a temporary magnetic field. So the answer is A. Residual is where the magnetic field, when removed, a little bit of magnetism is left over. So if you went for B, that's when there's a little bit of magnetic field left over. Question five, which of these is not practical use of electromagnets? So which of these is not a practical use of electromagnets? So the choices we've got are a solenoid, a speaker, a heater, and D, a relay. So A, B, C, or D, pause here. So here's your hint. How does each device work? So think about how a solenoid works, how a speaker works, how a heater works, and how a relay operates. So the answer here is a heater. A heater may put out a tiny little bit of a magnetism, but that's not its purpose. It produces heat. A solenoid uses a magnetic field to operate a latch or do something like that. A speaker uses a magnetic field in interaction with a second magnetic field to make audible sounds. And a relay uses the pulling of a solenoid and an armature to operate a switch. So that's a relay. So the odd man out in this case was the heater. Six, how can the direction of a magnetic field be determined without knowing the direction of the current? So this one's a little bit tricky. How can the direction of a magnetic field be determined without knowing what the direction of the current is? A, could we sprinkle iron filings on a piece of paper over it or something like that to see the direction of the field? B, could we put a compass inside the field and see which way the pointer points? Could we use a multimeter to measure the current? Or could we use the right hand rule? So pause here. Here's your hint. How is north and south determined? You know, how, what, what, what are the rules? What makes north north and what makes south south? So the best answer was to put a compass in the field. So get a compass, which has already been magnetized to show north and south, put it in the field. And obviously the north end of the compass will point to the north end of the field. Could we use a multimeter? We could, but then we would then have to also use the right hand rule. So the proper, the best answer to using just one device was to put a compass in the field. Question seven, what are the three basic categories of electromagnets and provide an example of each? So make a list of the three 
basic categories of electromagnets and an example of each. So these tend to be grouped by their use. Grouped by their use. So here's the answer. Attraction. An example would be solenoids and relays. Repulsion would be the magnetic arc break in a large circuit breaker or a large contactor and used as in it just a straight inductor and that's often used in filtering circuits in power supplies and things the like. So attraction, repulsion and an inductor. Question 8. Got two buzz bars are mounted at 45 millimeters apart and experience a fault current of 20,000 amps, 20 kA. What is the magnetic force over one meter length? So pause here. Here's your hint. Force is 2 times 10 to the 7, multiply I1, multiply by I2, divided by the distance. Okay, so here's how I worked it out. I'll just quickly turn on my pen and explain the maths. So remember our 2 times 10 to the minus 7 is just a constant way of turning everything into Newtons. And here I've simply got 20,000 amps times 20,000 amps. By the way, I could have gone 20,000 amps squared, but you never know, you might have a different current in one phase or one bar to the other, but in this case, 20 amps in both. Remember, our distance was 45 millimeters. So I had to move the decimal point one, two, three points to the left, making it point 045 of a meter. You do the maths and you get 1778 newton of force. So we get 1700 odd newtons of force. Question 9 What is the magnetic force produced by an air cord coil of 300 turns? It had a current of 35 amps through it. So pause here. Here's your hint. Magnemotive force Fm equals I times N. So pause again. And here's the final answer. Very, very simple, very straightforward. We simply had our 35 amps multiplied by the number of turns and that gives us 10,500 amp turns. Don't forget to put the units in when you're doing these calcs. It's very, very important. So 10,000 500 amp turns. And our last question, question 10. A coil has been wound with 1,500 turns or 1,500 turns over a length of 100 millimeters. What is the magnetizing force if a current of 0 0.5 or half an amp passes through the coil? So pause here while we have a go at this last question. Here's your hint. H equals Ni divided by L or H equals Fm divided by L, same thing. So pause here again if you need to and do the calc. So again, our 1500 turns came from the question, our current at half an amp 
and we were told it was a 100 millimeters, that's 0.1 of a meter. Remember, we have to turn this back into meters, so we're going to divide by meters. And you should have got 7,500 amp turns per meter. So that's electromagnetism, lesson one, our student tutorial exercises. I hope you've learned a little bit and you tested yourself on how well you've understood the, the second part of electromagnetism.